everybody, this is Andrew Greer with CCM Magazine, and we are sitting down with multiple Dove nominee, Grammy nominee, Stellar Award winner, Travis Green. So glad hey, to have man. you in the house today. What's up, my friend? Yeah, so you grew up with music yeah. around. This was, you were no stranger to music. No. Growing up in South Carolina? No, I grew up predominantly in Georgia. Okay. In the great state of Georgia. Um, moved to South Carolina recently, but okay. my mother grew up in South Carolina, my mother and father, but I'm a Georgia boy at heart. Okay, so what was your first influence of music? Then? Oh man, there's a guy by the name of John P. Key, who's a, <laughs> uh, he's a gospel artist, but um, hey, we know he was my Michael Jackson <laughs> growing up. I mean, he was, he was everything, you know. My yeah. mother was a choir director, okay. so music, gospel music was kind of like oxygen in our home. It was unavoidable, uh -huh. and um, but John P. Key was just my that was my guy, man. Yeah, yeah. We were talking. I adored him. I love how we were talking about um, just a second ago about CC and Tamla. So yeah. I grew up on CC. That yeah. was kind of like my total jam. But when Tamla came along, and yeah. what did you say about him? Yeah, I, I would say <laughs> the difference between them, and I, I love them both. They're both great friends of mine. <laughs> but CC is uh, is is the wedding ceremony. Tamla is the wedding reception. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that. CC is gonna make you cry and walk down the aisle and. <laughs> yeah. Her voice is just angelic. I mean, she's yeah. an angel. Um, but Tam is going to pull emotions out of you. You didn't know we're there. Sure. You're going to find yourself standing and jumping and like, <laughs> yeah. what is happening to my body? This is, feels amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I remember that experience. I've talked about this a lot where I grew up, you know, in pretty rural Texas, yeah. uh, predominantly Caucasian, Hispanic mm -hmm. communities. And so very reverent church services, mm -hmm. sit down, be quiet. And I fell in love with black gospel music and through actually through Motown, I kind of yeah. had this circuitous route and uh, remember going to some of these great churches in Dallas and their traditions and the, 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 tr the tradition, I mean, not even the tradition, the trajectory of the service was to stand up and shout. Yeah. And now I think about you as a pastor and stuff like, is it, don't you feel like that's a more accurate response? I think in, it's in a both consideration end. of like... I think it's a both end. I okay. think it's a both end. I, I think there's a fine line between... Um, responding out of um, just pure joy for God, which okay. I think is definitely um, necessary. And and then there's a, this line of just kind of responding just out of emotionalism. Mm -hmm. You know, I think response with no change is a waste of time. I think unless your, your hallelujah is preceded by yes, then it's just a word, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think um, somewhere in there, there should be heart uh, transformation. And what I recognize, because I worked on both sides, I recognize I worked at a predominantly white church where it was okay. v very more, you know, just kind of reserved. And sure. uh, I've been the only black guy on staff at a white church, and I've been the only white guy on staff at, at a black church. So, <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind, of both, yeah. kind of both worlds. But, uh, but uh, you know, one, <laughs> one of the things that I, I noticed um, in, in more reserved, services i would think that it was ineffective because i'm like man i'm up here singing my heart right, out playing right. this and no one's yeah, moving and, and, and yeah, you know yeah, it's just yeah. you know I, I, someone would be on the front row someone might wink at you yeah, yeah and they're like <laughs> hand, you know sit it down yeah. and, and i'm like man they're just they i'm boring them to death like they're asleep and then afterward they're like oh my god my life was just wrecked and god did so much in my heart and i'm like Really? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you had to be up and, and jumping around for that to happen. Yeah. And so I noticed that, you know, um, it's really, it's the work of the Holy Spirit and sure. he can do it however he wants to. But I think the most important thing is for that to happen, for there to be a communication with him. Mm -hmm. Take it to the title of the new record, Crossover, because that's a, uh, that's a term, like, especially in regards to music that's used a lot like secular versus mainstream, and you could even, in some ways, gospel, CCM, yeah. kind of all that, that you're even talking about. But it just means something different, right? Yeah, yeah, it really has nothing to do with that. Yeah. Um, but I think that helps catch people's attention, like, sure. whoa, what's happening? Sure. Is he a rapper now? Like, what's <laughs> happening over here? <laughs> um, no, he's a white boy in a white church. <laughs> <laughs> I think, for me, it, it was, um, if you pay attention to the album, it's really a journey. Of one of the fascinating stories for me um, in the Bible was the story of the Israelites in Exodus, how they had this amazing opportunity to to walk into freedom, um, to leave years of bondage, you know, almost 400 years of bondage. And yet 
uh, only two of them, you know, Joshua and Caleb, mm -hmm. were able to enter the promise. And so really, the, the album, if you pay attention kind of to the songs, they're all alluding to um, our journey with God and our ability to leave what was and embrace what's waiting, hmm. to leave a place of complacency um, to a place that requires our faith. And it, it's very, it, it's something that can be very scary mm -hmm. because faith is risky. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what songs kind of talk about. Um, while I'm waiting, I'm getting stronger. It talks about, you know, what the title track, Crossing Over. Mm -hmm. It talks about how he waited on us, even in our rebellion. Um, and, and the songs kind of turn and, and talk about that journey with God. It, it really is, and I stole this from John Gray, it really is an, our, our opportunity to take the cross over, you know, mm -hmm. to really take the gospel of Christ into into places. Um, and that that's what it was all about, mm -hmm. even in the story in Exodus. Um, when Moses spoke to Pharaoh, he said that God said, let my people go so that they can worship me. And they were supposed to be a beacon of light to the world around them. And I think it's the same thing with us. It, it doesn't just free us for us to be free, but it free us so that we can shine our light and other mm -hmm. people can be free because of that freedom they see in us. Yeah, and you, you were talking about even in the like venue choices on your yeah. tour. Yeah. Like talk about that, about how you've been even selective yeah. in where you're presenting this music. Yeah, so for the crossover live tour, we, we decided not to do church venues. Uh, which is crazy because it's all I've ever done. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah. and um, you're a pastor. Well, yeah, and I'm a pastor, <laughs> so I love church. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted to really um, put our money where our mouth was, and to do what what, what we believe that God placed in our heart, and to take the crossover. And the the way that we decided to do that was to go into neutral territories, is what we call it. Mm -hmm. You know, beyond it just being a bar or a concert venue or a theater. I think it's neutral territory. It's, it's a place that's not intimidating for mm -hmm. anyone with mm -hmm. any issues. And, and that's the beautiful thing about the cross. It doesn't discriminate um, that God is not intimidated by our, our problems, our issues. He, he has blood that is qualified to cover it. And so we take it to these places. And uh, I mean, and one of the most rewarding things for me in it, too, one, um, just the diversity that's there. I, I didn't know so many people even knew my music of different cultures and different backgrounds of different ages. I was that's something that's really kind of taken me aback. Like, wow, I didn't know the music had that much impact on on the different nationalities and stuff. But I think because of it being in neutral territory, not in a black church or not in a white sure. church, people are like, well, I feel like I can go to that. And so we've seen um, that. And then the other thing, just I would say, any given night, probably a third of the audience receives salvation, and that's just. Crazy. Is that through like a tradition? Are you doing like kind of traditional altar calls, or how are you, you know, how are you administering yeah. that? Because I know that's always a fine line mm -hmm. in any kind of Christian gospel sure. music. You're delivering the gospel yeah. essentially through music, but not everyone feels qualified yeah. to say, yeah, you know, X, Y, Z. So how does that look in the night? And of course, you're a pastor, so yeah. I guess that's really comfortable. Why well, I, I yell at them, tell them that they're all <laughs> sinners and going to hell. So no, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I love it. And it works. Yeah. Fear. No, we are not I, evolving. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just let them know. I, I, the gospel still works, man. It doesn't yeah. need a whole bunch of jazz or, yeah. you know. It, prompts. It, yeah, prompts. It, it just works. And I, I, I share with them the gospel that there is a God who loved them enough mm -hmm. to give his life for them and let them know that, um, that he wants them more than they want him mm -hmm. and, and that he is the only one that can fix them. I kind of help erase the lie that and I think many people buy it that we can fix ourselves. And so Amen. a lot of people have a good heart and they they you know they don't have a problem with God, but it's sure. like, well let me fix me before I come to God because yeah. I don't want to fake. And it's like, well that's the worst possible thing you could do. If you could fix yourself, you would have been fixed by now. Like you yeah. need him. He designed you to need him. And so that's the pitch I give. Like br bring it to him and allow him to to clean you, he's, he's qualified for it, and he wants to, mm -hmm. and he loves you enough to handle it. And so I think once people really hear about the love of God, you know, for them, it's like, okay, I can do mm -hmm. this, you know. And then we, we try to partner with different local churches and, and try to give them, you know, at our product table, we let them know different churches that they could get plugged in with mm -hmm. because we believe in community. And so, and people just respond, man. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's cool taking them from a neutral spot, a place they feel comfortable coming yeah. in and being able to, it's not that everyone would be necessarily afraid or intimidated by church or yeah. once they've started to experience that transformation in life, wouldn't want to plug in with the community, yeah. but it's not necessarily the first entry point. It's yeah. not the place they can walk in first. You, you, hashtag engage culture. This yeah. is like the, I won't, 
we don't have to put hashtag in front of it. That's how <laughs> I was thinking, you know? But okay, so this move, kind of movement, yeah. is that what you would call it? Of course, yeah. That you have um, really foundationed. Yeah. Talk more about what, in, and, and I've heard like even like even in your church and even take it back just to you and your wife and your family's mm-hmm. visions to help redefine culture. Yeah. For God, so what does this engaged culture? What does redefining culture look like? Yeah, you know. Yeah, it, it is an invitation to move upstream, to not just wait. I feel like for so long the believers have waited downstream for mm-hmm. the world around us to narrate mm-hmm. what what it is that we're supposed to do or how we're supposed to respond. And, and culture is everything, right? It's the rhythm of a generation. It's the clothes we wear, the art we collect. The food we eat, sure. the philosophies we embrace is unavoidable. It, it is it's what defines an era. Mm-hmm. And um, I believe there's only three responses we can have to culture. One, we could complain about it, um, uh, which is really easy to do and sure. fun sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> we conform to it, mm-hmm. which is also sometimes easier to do. Or we could confront culture. We can confront it and become the change that we want to see. It's one thing to vote about change. It's one thing to tweet about change. Um, it's a whole other thing to become that change, whether it's in our police force or in our education system, in the medical field, um, or, or in my case, in, in music and ministry, mm-hmm. becoming a change. For me, I was a little bored um, with some of the music that was being offered up. I was a little bored with, with church, um, mm-hmm. just being very transparent. It was like, is this it? You know, and I was a complainer mm-hmm. and then I became a conformer and then God challenged me. He said, no, I didn't create you to be either of those things. You are to confront uh-huh. and become the change. If you, if there's something else that I'm burning in your heart, because um, oftentimes the frustration will be the passageway of a passion um, mm-hmm. for us to, to actually see, oh, this isn't just something I'm supposed to be upset with. It's something that's supposed to spark um, a response, and that's what we're trying to do, you know. Well, and yeah, we were talking about how complacency, which goes, I think, with that complaining, yeah. right? Like that is always kind of nipping at our heels. Yeah. It's the easy response, of right? Of course, yeah. And the most, maybe even the most natural response in just our humanity. Yeah. But it, but out of our spirituality. Yeah. Well, Jesus was a culture engager. I mean, yeah. he, he just, he didn't wait, you know. He moved upstream, and he... It was like, no, this is this is the way I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna present to you a whole nother culture. You heard it said that it's like this, but you know, no. This is how we're gonna do it. And it's a shocker, you know, people yeah. are like, Well, and so um you you have to be ready for that. You have to be ready for um people to to question why why are you doing what you're doing? But for me it it is the the mission, I think, behind my movement, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and it's what my team constantly challenged me with because I'll be honest, man, I'd rather be complacent. It's easier, you know, mm-hmm. it's easier just to kick back and not ruffle any feathers and just, okay, mm-hmm. we're just going to hang over here. Um, but even stemming back from uh, last year, the the inauguration of President Donald Trump, you know, when I was invited to do that, my initial response was, uh, this could mess some things up, mm-hmm. you know. I'm sure it wasn't the most popular in yeah, your yeah. audience or really in culture right now. Yeah, yeah. I was like that, you know, this is just probably not a good idea. Um, and then, you know, I was encouraged to at least pray about it. And so I prayed about it. And I reached out to, to my mentors throughout America, um, uh, just prominent men and women who, who uh, lead uh, amazing churches or have great ministries. And I reached out to them and everyone said go. Everyone mm-hmm. said yes, really? and and one of them, who I respect very much, he asked. He said, "What would Jesus do? What would you, what would what would be his response?" And I was like, "Oh!" And then another preacher preached to me about Jonah, and was like, "Do you not remember? He was the <laughs> one who said who was worthy of receiving, you know?" You're like, "Yeah, but Trump's God. a whale, and he'll eat me." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "I don't want to be Jonah." <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So well, okay. That, that's what that's that was why I did it to yeah. engage culture. Well, okay, yeah. Now I was gonna tie that in exactly because what? Tell me. So you got all this response, this response to go, to be a part, to yeah. to engage. What's the motivation though? When you think back on that, like, so why am I motivated to do that? Because you could easily say no, no one would have known. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think it was two things that motivated me. One. Um, I think when when the one pastor told me about the Jonah thing, it yeah. really, man, it it really impacted me in a major way because it's like at what point do we think as believers we're qualified to say who deserves the, the sure. truth of God? Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. ooh, regardless of your political, 
you know, where you land, regardless of what you feel, regardless of, you know, how angry you are about certain things. Like, who are we to, to say who deserves to receive the love and the light of Christ? And that challenge was one of the major things. And then when I looked in, in the New Testament at the, the apostles, they were fearless and they, they were all about spreading the gospel. And so those were the major deciding factors and wanting to really do what it is that I believe is in my heart to do, to engage culture in every facet. And so if God opens the door and if I pray about it, he gives me a green light, then I believe it's my responsibility to take his love and his light into that territory. And if I don't, um, I, man, I, I, I'm, I fear more having to answer to him than to man. And I think when people heard the why behind, they were, they were okay with it. And the response across the board was way more um, positive responses than negative responses. Yeah. yeah, in my mind, to boycott people is to boycott the gospel. Yeah, you know, you can't, you can't eliminate people from the equation. Yeah. I can't eliminate myself. Speaking of influential people, though, last question. So Kirk Franklin. Yeah. Right. He says that you're the future of gospel music. Yeah. You kind of grew up on Kirk Franklin. Didn't oh you? yeah. Oh yeah. He came to my Dallas show last week, and I, I did a whole trip. And you're like, tour. hold up, I'm the future. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. Like, Is that Kirk? Yeah, you know, exactly. Heads, no, yeah, yeah, you're just, no I, just, I just stopped the song and gave him a shout out so, so I can win the crowd back. Kirk Franklin's here, everybody. All right, Beth. Because like, everyone's like, get you on that stage, that's Kirk. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah. But no, he is, um, that man is is so supportive. He is just an incredible um, influencer. He remains relevant through decades. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. Um, but to to be called the future by someone like that is man it's it's crazy i mean but he you know he's someone who didn't just jump on the bandwagon he was supportive years ago um, i met him years ago in a, at a hotel and um mm. in a hotel lobby at an award show and uh he treated me like i was doing something way back then and this was almost 10 years ago so this is wild and he was like oh man you are a bad boy this that and that. i'm like why do you know who I am? <laughs> and, um, so ever since then, he's just he's just been a, a, a huge supporter, man. Yeah. And, um, and he came to the show, and I did an entire tribute to him, um, and, and sung some of his songs. And the crowd just they loved it. But Kirk, man, I mean, whew, well, what 20, 30 say? years from now, another generation of artists will be saying, "Travis Green's in the crowd." <laughs> oh, man. Has a turn. All right, that's crazy yeah. to me. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, I, I, my wife asked me a question a few months ago. She said, how does it feel to be living in the dream? You know, and mm -hmm. this is all I've ever wanted to do mm -hmm. um, is music, you know, from studying John P. Key, CC, um, Kirk, Tamala, you know, studying these people for my entire life. This is, you know, this is all I ever wanted to do. And so to have the opportunity of doing it, it's just, it's crazy, man. And my sons, they love it. They're three and one, but they love music already. And they perform every single day. So I think they're going to take after me. All right. Even though their mom is a, a doctor, I think they're going to do the music. <laughs> they're like, who wants books? <laughs> yeah. Give me a guitar already. <laughs> yeah. Who wants financial security? <laughs> <laughs> We're grateful for you. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. So much pain from the choices that we have made. So much we would change. Can't help but wonder if it's too late. There's a truth that just might save us. Love is a language stronger than hate. Love is forgiveness, it doesn't run away Love needs no weapon, it is its own defense In the end, love will always win I see so much war and Do we know what we're fighting for? Turns apart, yeah. But the battles within our hearts, and there's a truth that just might.
gave us love is a language stronger than hate. Love is forgiveness, it doesn't run away. Love needs no weapon, it is its own defense in the end. Love would always win, always. Our love, we've got nothing. Oh, yeah. Faith moves mountains. With our love, we've got nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tons of angels. With our love, we've got nothing. Oh, no, no, no. Faith moves mountains. Always win war in the end. Love will always.